Bacteria came long before us. Of course. Okay? 3.5 billion years. And we are a playground for these people. Your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your muscle, everything is linked with the gut bacteria somehow. Behind every successful brain, there is your stomach. There is this uh, Bristol stool chart. Okay. Okay. It's a formal, it's a formal well structured, chart. Uh, structured chart where a gastroenterologist, we use it to see whether the patient is constipated oh. or the patient is diarrhea. Is there a link or association between gut microbiome and your sex life? Does that exist? Uh, it does. Or which country has the most optimized diet? I'm just starting from a pure gastroenterology standpoint. I'm going to get some beef for this. What are the major red flags which destroy your gut health? Like, mm. It's an absolute no-no. When you're tearing a package, you're tearing a piece of your gut. And the wake-up call was because you know I had a small uh, a heart attack oh. uh, at the age of like 34, 35. Oh, that's scary. Women, they think that if they lift weights, they will become muscular like Hrithik Roshan. Right. I know that every condition in my book, the treatment is weight loss. For your gut, I am the trainer. Thank you Dr. Paul for thank you. coming to Muscle Blaze podcast all the way from California. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, just to start with, uh, we would want that if you could tell our viewers uh, a brief about your background. Right, we all know you are the most viral doctor right now going on. <laughs> uh, but what's the, what's the history behind it? Uh, what's your speciality? Where did you study? Ha, ha, so, ha. just a small uh, brief introduction. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, KP. Thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, my name is Palani Apan Manikam. Right. I cut short to Dr. Pal as soon as I reached US. Oh, oh okay. And, <laughs> to uh, keep it simple. That was when? This was in uh, 2006 actually. Oh, it was long back. Long back. Right. I finished my MBBS in Coimbatore. Oh, nice. And then I wanted to do uh, you know, state-of-the-art medicine at that time. So I decided to apply for United States medical licensing exams. Oh, lovely. Uh, if it clicks, it clicks. If not, uh, it's okay. So, But um, uh, I got a visa on a master's in public health, which is a, a separate degree. Okay. So right. I came here and then simultaneously I applied for mm. USMLEs mm. and then I joined uh, residency MD General Medicine in 2008. Got it. And then I did my advanced, uh, I'm sorry, I did my fellowship in gastroenterology for three years. Right. Uh, and then did a chief residency for one year. So all together from 2000 to 2015, 15, 15 years of my training. Oh my God. Uh, even Ram one was is only 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, it had to come from you, right? I'm a great fan of your sense of humor, but that was lovely. <laughs> and at the right moment. <laughs> What's going on around? <laughs> okay. And uh, so you've been, uh, so you came into actual practice with patients by 2015. 2015. Right. Mm. And uh, that would be eight years now. Eight right. years, correct. And uh, you are working or you have an own clinic. How does it work in US? Huh. So I'm a, I'm a hospital based employee. Right. Uh, my hospital is very fond of me doing YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. My, yeah. Because you know, after YouTube, people started calling my office okay. to get appointments. Oh yes. It's exactly the opposite over yeah. here in India. India, yeah. uh, in US, we don't need that much amount of uh, patients to come in because yes. our next availability is like six months from now. Absolutely. So, um, hospital is like you know you should go on YouTube and then say that don't call us at India time. <laughs> Oh, that one, that one is funny, <laughs> right. right. But uh, the kind of audience you attracted, uh, was it mostly Indians or it, it was even, uh, you know, no, no, mainly US natives? In, mainly our, our people. Uh, mo mostly our own people. Our right? own people. And, own people. Uh, did Mr. Sarvana Kumar also visit you <laughs> <laughs> that you keep on calling him? <laughs> he was the one who was asking my manager in my uh, corporate hospital right. to uh, stop uh, asking me to stop doing YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So, uh, let's uh, move ahead, uh, Dr. Pal. So, just for our audience, mm. uh, why should they watch this podcast? What's your point of view? Uh, because Muscle Bliss is a good company. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. No, no. So, uh, uh, just to give give a sense, so Dr. Pal has many already interviews existing on the net, huh. right? But we wanted to have his point of view on certain, uh, uh, you know, 
issues which come with people when they're into performance training mm. when they're into gymming right they, they encounter a new world and there are certain issues which happen also there is not i would say there is not enough weightage that is given to this class of fitness mm. right if i may give it a class of fitness is a physical fitness you know there's a measurement of running there's a measurement of how much weight you can lift how much muscle mass do you have how much fat do you have but in all of this euphoria we have kind of forgotten which according to you is the genesis of all human living and how we perform right so it would be great to put some light on it uh, so let's move ahead uh, to the gut health part yes yes right? yes okay. now, um, let me just touch on a few things here one is you rightly pointed out that this has this area has not been mm-hmm. researched in the past Right. the last 15 years the amount of data that we have is just mind blowing right uh, similar to how for uh, physical fitness we have personal trainer correct and then for uh, mental fitness we have you know meditation trainer absolutely correct. right yeah. uh, for your gut <coughs> i am the trainer oh lovely. <laughs> <laughs> lovely right but what has changed in the last 15 years where did this measurement of gut came from matlab what happened is there there's some milestone that was achieved was there some technology that was cracked how come so much research on microbes in last 15 years correct so there was a human genome project that started oh yes like you know 20 years 30 years ago okay. where we kind of completely spliced all the genes in the human uh, species right. and we found we know exactly which gene is causing which disease oh. and based on that we can splice it and then join it and then prevent genetic diseases if we can Oh god so it. similar to that a project started you know 10 12 years ago uh trying to find out what are all the genes available in the bacteria in our uh-huh. gut oh but the only problem was it was a pandora box right absolutely <laughs> when you open there was no closing at all because it was 100 trillion bacteria in the intestine oh, to put two numbers it's one followed by 14 zeros only if my salary was that much <laughs> <laughs> if you line up these bacteria from earth it will reach up to the moon oh my god so it's that much amount of like so then what happened was it was just not the gut bacteria just digesting things alone mm-hmm. then we figured out that it is closely linked to every you disease that, that you and uh, all of this research was done uh, um, if i may say biologically picking up uh, samples and doing that or it was computer generated or or how was it so you know all clinical research usually starts in mice right okay little right. chuvas right right so you know i was involved in basic science research lab where we go early in the morning 5 am there are all these cages and then there is mice inside mm-hmm. and then i mesh i open the box see the mice see the amount of stool that the mice oh, has yes. excreted yeah. based sitting on a stool got it and uh, my mom was like oh my da- my son is a big scientist in california <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still learning after mice <laughs> mice poop mice poop <laughs> <laughs> not bad not bad i'm digressing from the topic but uh, uh, the trillion of bacteria that you spoke about is it very unique to human beings or is it the same with animals also right uh, because generally animals have slightly less variety of foods that they eat mm. as per my observation i'm not a biologist but you know uh, carnivores eat only meat and then uh, vegetarian uh, animals eat I mean, veg I'm right sure. but very few animals like us who dwindle between everything and also have burgers right so so how does it work So this concept is very interesting where you know bacteria came long before us of course okay yeah. 3.5 billion years correct and uh, we are just a newbies right to uh, put things into perspective let's say the planet earth was born on a 24 hour period mm-hmm. okay and the planet earth starts on midnight bacteria came in at 4 am uh. and we were born only few seconds before midnight So these guys came well before, before us. us, and we are a playground for these people. So they are actually living in us, <laughs> rather than us living. Us in living in them. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Absolutely. They need us, we need them, need them. and them. that's why when a baby is born right into the world, it's a fresh, expensive real estate. Absolutely. the bacteria just pounce upon it it's like getting a 2 by 10 by 10 room in a hard downtown of delhi 
Okay. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> and that that becomes a playground of bacteria, and it starts to develop. Correct. Oh, amazing. Correct. Amazing. Correct. So, how this works is um, we have both good gut bacteria and bad gut bacteria. Absolutely. So it's a mix of both. Right. Most of the times, these bad gut bacteria will not have any effect on us at all, right. because the good gut bacteria will controls it. Suppresses it. Will suppress it. So I usually compare this with Marvel Universe, where you have you know good characters like you know Iron Man, mm -hmm. Spider Man, Hulk, right. and the bad character is Thanos. Right. Uh, Thanos or Thanos? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that, but Thanos is lately very popular. Lately, really popular. <laughs> yes. So it depends upon which group that you have. It's a constant balance that goes every day of your life right. since you're born. Amazing. Mm. So Dr. Bell, uh, since I belong to this industry, I keep on going to various exhibitions, right? So exhibitions happen all around the world. There's one uh, which happens in Europe, US, US East Coast, West Coast, uh, then Asia also, Thailand, Dubai, etc. And for last one year, what I have observed is gut health and microbiome is everywhere. What puzzles me as a, as a person who is not knowledgeable in this sphere is they have all types of claims, which kind of puzzles me. So there will be a claim, a stall saying that we have proven microbiome to have an effect on your brain health, right? The other stall says it has an effect on your sleep, right? So I have done clinical research on that. The third one says that I have done a clinical research on a strain which affects your muscle endurance. Now, this is very, very hard for me to grasp that how can something in stomach improve your brain health, right? So can you put some light on this? Is this all fast or is this actually happening? No, it's actually happening. It's actually happening. Uh, so as with any claim, you know, there is, uh, there is no smoke without fire. Absolutely. Uh, so there is some truth to it, uh -huh. uh, but not to an extent that you take this bacteria, you will cure this disease. We are not there yet. Okay. okay, but we are definitely there where we can clearly say that each and every organ is linked with your gut bacteria. Okay. Your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your muscle, everything is linked with the gut bacteria somehow. Okay. So let's talk about the brain. Yeah, absolutely. So we, I always call the intestine as the second brain. Oh, yes. Second right. brain. But why would we call that? The reason is that there is 10 to 100 million neurons connecting this brain, brain. with this brain. Okay. It's a highway. Right. So uh, all the, the nervous system is called central nervous system over right. here. And this nervous system is called enteric nervous system. Enteric. enteric uh. Uh, why is the term enteric? So, you know, my field is called gastroenterology. Yes. Gastro is stomach. Right. Enterology is intestines. Ah, okay. So the intestine part is referred in to enteric, enteric, ah, okay. enteric nervous system, and all these gut bacteria that we are talking about. Yeah. Gut is not stomach. Gut is your that's, large intestine. That's the main ah. problem. We, whenever we say, sir, uh, we say, you know, go with your gut. You keep your hand in your stomach, and you're saying, and you have that good, good feeling when your nervousness is happening, right? So, oh, that's a big clarification. Ah, because right. bacteria cannot survive the acidic. The, in stomach, stomach. Right, so absolutely. they have to bypass that as quickly right. as possible, get into the intestine. Even small intestine is much less. Right. Uh, large intestine bacteria is 10,000 times more than the small intestine. Oh God, right. And But biologically, why has this been designed? Where you said that this is called center nervous system, it's called enteric nervous system. Uh, why have they have been designed in that way? Is it because the signals of hunger go from uh, this particular part of the brain to the main brain, which then tells you to hunt, to find food. Uh, is it because of that? So the brain does two things to the intestine. One, it controls the rate of flow. Let me explain that. So you eat something. What is your favorite food, uh, KP? Mm, egg and uh, toast. That's the answer of a bodybuilder. Yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else would have said biryani. Exactly. <laughs> Right, so I just imagine egg, toast, and avocado. <laughs> okay, so let's take biryani just for the yeah, audience. For the sake of example. <laughs> so eat biryani, right? So it takes usually 45 to 50 hours for the biryani to take from the oral cavity all the way to the anal orifice. Right. Okay. Uh, 
the rate that biryani passes from the esophagus to stomach, stomach to small intestine, small intestine to large intestine, and then coming out as stool, is determined by your brain. Oh. Okay. So the brain sends signals into the stomach. Mm -hmm. Basically, when something bad happens, the brain says that, okay, no, this is, we should not, not the have. Not time to eat. Not the time to eat. Yeah. Or this is not supposed to be inside. So let's say the biryani is contaminated. Oh, correct. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Right. So then it, it, you, ah, it, you puke it or you have diarrhea because ah. it just tries to expel very uh, fast. Okay. Other way around, let's say you are stressed out. So if I am hmm. understanding correct, even the signals uh, of uh, puking or diarrhea come from the brain because my understanding was, uh, uh, at least with puking or food poisoning puke, is that it's a reactive thing which happens in the stomach and stomach is giving signal that I don't like it, throw it out. Ha, ha, ha. Right. So, uh, it's all interconnected. Achha. That's what I'm trying to okay. say. Yeah. Okay. So, ideally, this is what the connection is. But the signal to the brain is going from the nerves first. Ah, so nerves surrounding the are intestine. saying that I don't like it, ha. it's something contaminated, please throw it out. Correct. And then the brain signals to the organs uh, which require you to push it out. Push it out or come uh, out as come well. Through diarrhea. Through diarrhea. Correct? Okay. Ah. So basically, okay, again in layman uh, understanding, brain is actually calculating the coordination between intestines, stomach and other such organs mm. to accept stuff or reject stuff. Correct. No. Correct. And then this, uh, uh, this nervous system around the intestines, they are constantly looking for things. Oh. They're constantly looking for things. Okay, biryani, what is there inside? Okay, so mm -hmm. it's a simple carb, so let's just digest it right away. Oh, complex carb, so that's good. Let's right. feed the good gut bacteria. Uh, oh, there is no protein at all. Oh my God, this is not good. So we are going to, this guy is going to be hungry again right. pretty soon. So constant monitoring. Uh, and the signals is like a highway that goes from here to the brain and brain to over here. Got it. So this keeps on happening. And Sorry. Oh yeah, the, the second role of the brain is that it also controls how much amount of fluid that is being secreted by the intestine into the stomach. Okay. The reason I'm saying that is it is also important for the digestion purposes. Ah. So the rapid the flow uh -huh. and more the fluid, better the digestion. Better the digestion. Ah, correct. Let's say you are stressed out. Right. Uh, let's say that uh, you are swiping a credit card and yeah. that is not going through. Right. Okay. You right. think there is money, but there is no money. There is no money. <laughs> <laughs> Why the time, you know, you see the beeping sound? Yeah. There is stress over there. I've, so course. when there's a stress, automatically the first thing that gets affected is the slowing down of the intestine. Intestine. Correct. That's why they say any kind of nervous moment, you say, go with your gut. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And is that why that I'm, I'm going back to my student days when exams are approaching, you stop feeling hungry. Correct. Right? Uh, you are more concerned about, uh, you know, what will happen at 11 a.m. when the question sheet comes <laughs> rather than that I should eat, I should feed. It's completely gone away. You are not feeling hungry at all. Correct. 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 Okay, correct. So that's, that's some, how stress is being... Stress is being manifested. Correct. The other way around is sometimes people can actually have hyper aggressive stimulation where they right. go have like frequent diarrhea, they go to the bathroom frequently before going into the uh, right. exam room. Right. So that is uh, possible as well. Right. So this kind of mechanism is a two-way mechanism. Two I say it's mechanism. a marriage between the brain, brain and, and the, the intestine. Intent, the intestine. Behind every successful man, there is a woman. Behind every successful brain, there is your stomach. stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So coming back to where we started the question, right? So what we have established here is the connection between the enteric nervous system and the central nervous mm, system. Mm. Now, how come uh, a good microbiome environment will lead to a good brain health? Will that happen? Correct. So, what we have seen in research is that this microbiome not only sends signals to the brain alone, it can control your brain as well uh, in the way that it wants to. Oh. So that's how powerful these bacteria are. Let's say that you have good bacteria. Okay, right. you did everything right. right. Eating good food, like, like you. Food, yeah. ah, variety yeah. of food. So you, you eat good food, there are good gut bacteria. So the good gut bacteria wants you to crave for the egg, avocado on the toast that you just oh. said. If it was me, I would have never said egg, toast and avocado. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not me. 
and it's the bad gut bacteria oh. in my intestine controlling my emotions so oh, that's amazing because does that mean that our habits have made this environment which is again controlling our habits absolutely right so when when somebody somebody says ki mera man nahi karta acha khana khane ka it's actually the whole microbiome which is further leading to tell you you don't want to eat this uh, egg toast you rather want to eat a lovely biryani absolutely man nahi pet okay uh. oh, that's a big revelation so it's it's all not man and you are blaming the man but it's the previous habits which have made the pet like that the your stomach your gut like that and now it's behaving that's that's amazing correct <laughs> oh nice it's it's uh, it's i'll tell you an example so we took two groups of mice okay we found out uh, how is the gut bacteria in this mice correct so we gave let's say biryani so the biryani to this mice and then we checked the gut bacteria we figured out that the gut bacteria which is digesting biryani propagates and thrives right okay and then it's to send signals to the brain to crave for biryani <coughs> even more, even more. Yeah. so we said okay you know what so the mice is tasting the biryani what if we remove the taste buds so we cut the taste buds yeah. okay and then we gave the biryani again yeah. what happened still he wanted it want to be right that's how powerful it is was the my connection of ha ah, because the gut bacteria is secreting chemicals right at the okay. junction of finally the chemical reaction ha ah, right. it's a drug factory over there it's a Actually, drug mafia it's a drug mafia <laughs> over there which is feeding on its own addictions own addiction right but okay uh, again taking a hypothetical situation i am eating biryani mm. i don't have any digestion issues mm. right mm. what's wrong in that nothing wrong in that correct nothing wrong with it you don't have any digestion issues at this time ah. what will happen in due course of time you know biryani uh, you, you can make biryani healthy as well let's say restaurant biryani which Let, has, let's say outside food, outside food. right ah. let's say it's a collection of you ordering burgers pizza ah, correct. biryanis ah right? biryanis correct everything is going fine your stomach is feeling good good no what good so our good bacteria needs fiber mm mm-hmm. all this thing that you said doesn't have any fiber Absolutely. at all when there is no fiber you are basically starving your bacteria the good ones the good ones mm-hmm. okay so then the bacteria need something to eat what will they eat they will eat the same carbohydrate that is available in in uh, that they didn't get right because of the lack of fiber the same carbohydrate is there along the lining of the intestinal cells oh god so these intestinal cells are lined like a firewall a cracker absolutely okay like 100 trillion firewall a cracker that you uh, fire uh, you do the fireworks in diwali mm-hmm. it is closely lined up so what is happening now is because of this uh, not having the fiber the lining is slowly being eaten up Oh god and there is creating space right when there is space created that is where your biryani causing the chemical dopamine seeping into the gap getting into the brain controlling the emotional brain. center right. making you crave and uh, this eating up of the intestine itself does it also lead to any diseases of physical nature apart from the brain uh, getting controlled obesity obesity big time right big time and immune problems what does that mean so along the lining of the intestine similar to how we talked about there are like you know 100 uh, 10000 million 100 million mm-hmm. sorry this is 100 trillion and that yes. is 100 million right. neurons are there uh, similar to that there are also immune cells okay which is lining the intestine as well mm-hmm. these immune cells always are on right. the lookout yeah correct because we are eating something we need to make sure that you know that is nothing pathogenic that is really causing the uh, uh, body to go down mm-hmm. so they're always on the lookout yeah. okay so when you are not feeding them properly they become hyperactive okay okay and they don't uh, uh, they don't know what to do mm-hmm. so then they create all these immune problems which you don't have okay and that's why if you see all these allergic problems autoimmune diseases have right. been on the rise in the last like 5 to 10 years 
because of these food habits, ruining your microbiome, microbiome eating the immune system, and then this immune goes. system gets activated, activated as if there is no tomorrow. So, you know, gluten allergy, you take it, you right. name it, you know, celiac disease. Right. Uh, being a gastroenterologist, I see this colitis, which is inflammation of yes. the colon. Yeah. We call it as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, right. where your body thinks that your colon doesn't belong to you. Doesn't belong to you. Oh so God. all these immune cells start eating up your own colon. Okay. Okay. When I was a medical student, if there is colitis, it was always tuberculosis. Right. But we now, have now it is an inflammatory bowel disease, bowel disease. Ah, right. which was a western disease before okay. now because we are following western diet diets and habits lifestyle lifestyle right so that's the right. problem here kp is that this doesn't happen right away so you eat pizza yeah. you will not have it tomorrow right if you happen every day or frequently over a span of five to ten years, Correct. that's where the problem happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And it further gets accumulated because there are other three lifestyle things that you are also not, you know, following. For example, late night sleeps. Correct. Right. Even when you're eating home food, you're not having a variety in that because I've been hearing you like you need probiotic foods, fermented mm -hmm. foods, so mm -hmm. all of this encapsulated together. But okay, again, coming back to the topic, I think we started with how microbiome affects brain. My second one was how microbiome affects humidity, but I think we have already covered Correct. that particular thing. Mm, mm. I think you mentioned something which we kind of left in between was uh, microbiome damage leading to obesity. Correct. So can you throw some light on that? So we, we could understand the whole uh, eating of the intestine part, but where does metabolism get ruined and where does it lead to obesity? So, um, so remember I told you about this uh, chemical reaction, okay? So... One of the main chemical that we usually talk about is dopamine, right? Correct. So in your Insta Reels scrolling, yep. dopamine hit makes you happy. Yeah. You see food, you know, all these vloggers, yeah. when they make all this biryani, the you first thing, that, ah, you feel salivate. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about fasting in my channel. <laughs> During my video, Swiggy comes in as ad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. <laughs> right. So uh, all these are emotionally connected. Okay, so this chemical dopamine is connected directly to your emotional uh, decision making. Right. So in due course of time, when you eat all this processed high calorie dense foods, um, even though you try to limit yourself, what will happen is because of this imbalance of this good gut bacteria, bad gut bacteria, mm -hmm. bad gut bacteria overpopulates, secretes dopamine, seeps into the nervous system, gets into your brain, stimulates cravings, even without your control, you will be eating high calorie dense foods. That is a direct correlation of your right. obesity thing. And that will accumulate into too much calorie surplus, Correct. limited activity, Correct. leading to weight gain. Correct. The other angle to this is that in terms of how we talked about that, you know, your emotions are being controlled, you can also create chemicals like GABA, which is an, another mm -hmm. inhibitory neurotransmitter mm -hmm. uh, and depletes the serotonin, which is a good hormone to have, mm -hmm. which might cause depression oh. in people. Oh God. Correct? So that's why they say that, you know, mental health is related to gut bacteria. Right. So people think that you're stressed eating, you're, you're stressed out, so that's why you're eating a lot more. Mm -hmm. You are stressed out because of the bad gut bacteria and you are eating because your gut bacteria wants, wants to, to eat. It's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. The biggest question is we don't know which is the chicken and which is the, the egg. egg. Ah. But is more and the... more and more research is pointing towards that. Right. This might be the primary problem. Primary mm. problem. So coming back to going back to my exhibitions, right, where different uh, probiotic solutions have been put ah, for ah, all of this. Ah, ah. Now, let's say I'm in a stage where my metabolism is all over the place. I'm going towards obesity. So what, what are these solutions? Are they adding the good bacteria back so that the balance kind of comes, uh, you know, to the, to the ideal state? Mm -hmm. Is that what they're trying to do? That is the idea. That's the idea. Ah, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah. So remember I talked to you about this uh, 100 trillion bacteria. Correct. So KP has completely unique 100 trillion. Right. PAL has completely unique 100 trillion. Absolutely. Un maybe identical twins, maybe have a little bit uh, same, but besides them, it's completely different. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So what these people are trying to do is that, okay, so, you know, let's give 1 billion of lactobacillus, 1 billion of bifidobacteria. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. More, right? Because these are all considered as healthy, good bacteria in research. But to be honest, we don't know whether this is good bacteria or not. Right. The reason is what we are reviewing is a, is a person, as a Western person where research has been done. Mm. And they don't eat processed foods that much that they, are, they control. Mm. So this is like looking at a plane after a wreckage. Absolutely correct. We don't know where is the friend. Ah, yes, the, without the black box. Without the black box, correct? Yeah. So you're looking at the plane. You go, oh, okay. So this patient is not obese. So maybe this is what the good bacteria is. It is. Uh, oh, this patient is obese. Or maybe, okay, this bacteria is more in this person. So that's why it's called obesity. So that is where we are right now. Oh, God. So this whole plane to be put together, it will take five to ten years. But how do then I address the issue? Let's say if my friend... Uh, is going through this, what should he be start digging then? Let's huh. say, let's take obesity as an example. Huh, huh, huh. So, one common denominator that we know is to grow good gut bacteria, we need three Fs. Okay? okay. The first one is fermented foods. Got it. The second one is fiber. Lovely. Okay. The third one is, I just added because I like it, fasting. <laughs> <laughs> if I say three F's, right. you will have the next F, which is fun in your life. Right. And you will not have the last F, which is farting. <laughs> <laughs> we will come to that. We'll come to that. <laughs> because high protein food is highly related <laughs> to it. Yes. So these are the things that we can do to improve the good gut bacteria. Right. That we know for sure that this denominator has improved uh, healthy bacteria in all these patient populations right. uniformly. Right. So it, it's kind of a, uh, it's a sweep shot, which is kind of covering most of the bases, uh, right? Hmm. And you're trying to reach a stage where, you know, at least you have covered what can be done with a particular patient. Correct. Correct. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So lovely. Uh, does water also has a role to play? Right. Does hydration also has a role to play? In, uh, Significantly. Significantly, our, you know, I, I talk big on circadian rhythm on my channel, yes, where uh, I strongly believe that our hormones are acting in a beautifully synchronized, melodious, orchestrated rhythm. Mm -hmm. And all these hormones, especially insulin, cortisol, melatonin, these are three main hormones we usually make a play major role. And cortisol loves water. Loves water. Hydration is one of the main thing. Our cells absolutely love it. And so, that's the case with the good bacteria also. Correct. So when these hormones are acting well, it is a vicious cycle again. Right. So then, you know, the energy level is high. You will make a correct decision. Then you could get bacteria propagates. So then it will make you even crave for water as well. So... Oh. Huh. Oh, is it? So it's it's a it's a it's a nice oh, vicious cycle. It's a symbiotic uh, symbiotic relationship. relationship. Bacteria are not bad. Right. Uh, it is how we treat them. How we treat them. So for the audience, I can say that from after this podcast, mm. whenever you eat, you need you are pregnant. Think like you are pregnant. Correct. You need to eat for two people. Right. <laughs> one for, for yourself the, one and for good, one for the bacteria. Good bacteria. Correct. <laughs> right. Maybe and your bacteria doesn't like pizza. Right. And he likes <laughs> pizza. Three Fs, right? So, okay, I'll recollect this. Fermented food, there is fiber and there is fasting. Fasting. Fasting, the research is not that much. Mm -hmm. It is still in baby stages. Right. But I just threw it because, you know, in five to ten years, it will be mainstream. Right. <laughs> and uh, what's the role of physical activity? Does that also play a huge role in terms of the uh, environment? So, physical activity directly improving good gut bacteria has not been mm -hmm. shown yet. Okay. But we can postulate, you know, we can extrapolate and then say that, okay, physical activity is increasing the, you know, the BDNF, you know, brain-derived neurotropic factor in the brain. Correct. Um, so that is in turn stimulating the good gut bacteria. So there is a relationship together. Right. So, but there is no uh, research enough to tell that this much, let's say if you walk for 45 minutes, you know, uh, you, there is a research for how VO2 max increases by physical activity, uh, right? There is uh, a measurement for uh, that. Uh, so, there is no measurement that physical activity directly impacts good gut bacteria as of now. As of now. As of now. 
uh, but we can extrapolate and based on what we saw in you know mice and uh, basic research and findings that mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say you tell you in in mice, what we do is we make the mice run on treadmill. Correct. <laughs> so we had two groups of mice where the one mice didn't do anything. It's like a typical desk job, okay. eight to five, nothing to be done in right. a cage. Right. The other mice, we made them run on treadmill uh, as much as it could, and you check the gut bacteria with the same amount of diet. Right. The good gut bacteria was awesome. much better in exercise. In the exercise. Uh, right. But when we translate that into clinical human patients, mm -hmm. what happens is people who are exercising are already having a good diet to start with. Right. So the good gut bacteria in that person, we are not sure whether it is because of the exercise, the exercise or the habits. dietary habits. Right. But we are extrapolating that, it might be true. Out of curiosity, uh, we are digressing a bit. Uh, but this uh, microbiome, as I understand, is a result of years and years of evolution, mm. right? Mm. And I'm sure that at some point, uh, you know, not every variety or fermented foods were available, mm. right? Fermentation might be, you have a better knowledge, might be some 800,000 years old or even more than that. But mm. human beings have been much older than mm. that, mm. right? So how's the evolution of uh, gut microbiome has been, if you can tell us in a sure. bit? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So all this problem started in the last 400 years, okay. <laughs> where industrial revolution started coming in, right? Where food was starting to produce in mass amounts, correct? Where we went through wheat, rice for big mass production. Uh, uh, not like wheat and rice is bad; it is just that the fiber content is low. low. Uh, compared to our ancestral methods of eating. Until 12,000 years ago, the thing was always hunting and gathering. Absolutely correct. Hunting and gathering. Right. And this industrial revolution has just kind of like fastened the way that we consume. And our gut bacteria is not ready for it. How do we know? You know, there is this tribal community in Tanzania. It's called Hadza. Hmm. This is the only tribal community was still belong to the hunting and gathering yeah. community still. Right. If you look at their stool specimen, the number of species of gut bacteria is 1600. 1600. 1600. And in a modern urban? It's only 1200. Okay. So species. Remember, 100 trillion bacteria, right. 1600 species. species. But in 1600, we lost 400 right. species. It's all like right. almost like losing a tiger species, Absolutely. lion species. Yeah. 400 species is lost. 25% is lost. Lost. And if you calculate the amount of fiber that they take, yeah. 150 grams of fiber per day. My God. And how much we get, average Western is only 15. 15 grams. 15 grams of fiber right. per day. So in due course of time, we just lost. And after like second or third generation, we will not be able to get it back. Replicate it. Absolutely. It is like deforestation. Oh. So you... Because those are lost forever after second or third generation. Okay. So it's like deforestation, first year 25% yes. is gone. Yes. If you replant the trees again, then, then you'll be able to get back. Then able to get back. Second year, third year, if you lose like 75%, that's it. Right. The whole forest is gone. Right. Right. And that's why it's absolutely important for every parent out there to make sure you know what is gut bacteria, how you so can promote good gut bacteria in the kids. In the kids. So we can create a better world for our kids. Uh, so this uh, hunter-gatherer story, right, uh, I love going back to the institute <laughs> because they had the best habits. Correct. This takes care of the two F, right, the fiber uh, is very natural when you're hunting-gathering and fasting is also very natural correct. because you don't know when you will get your next food, Correct. Correct. right, and that's very natural part. Mm. Uh, but where does fermentation come in for the hunter-gatherer? So fermentation is a very interesting factor. Compared to fermentation, high fiber is much more, is impactful. Much more impactful. So, so that's where your prebiotic and probiotic comes in. Right. So when when I, what are we finally we are going to get it? We're going to get a good gut bacteria, correct? Right. That is what the right bottom line is. You can get there by feeding fiber, which is the food for the gut bacteria, which means the gut bacteria itself will grow. Okay. 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 The second step is. 
we will give you good, good bacteria. bacteria from outside ha ah, mm. so prebiotic is the fiber fiber food that we are giving right. probiotic is the actual bacteria actual bacteria what i take on a daily basis is called a symbiotic mm -hmm. symbiotic is both prebiotic and probiotic okay. not with capsules or supplements or anything like that in with through natural foods right my go to thing is yogurt right which is a probiotic uh -huh. mixed with banana slices banana is fiber complex polysaccharides yes or nuts nuts which has complex polysaccharides as well right. so that is the best symbiotic that you would ever get Oh, lovely. Mm. So, what would would be the top uh, three sources of probiotic and prebiotic that? Uh, so, probiotic is always fermented foods, correct? Okay. Um, so, fermented foods. What I take on a almost regular basis is I love the he. Right. Curd is like my right. favorite thing. Right. Uh, and then I'm a South Indian, so idli. Of course. <laughs> of course. This is from my one of my favorite one. Mm. And then um, you know I have gotten used to kanji. Which Kanji. is oh, ah yes, fermented yes, black carrot yes. drink. Pretty famous in North India. Yeah, correct, right. correct. And then I love dokla. <gasps> oh yes. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Should we order some? <laughs> Homemade dokla, two yes. to three pieces is yeah. is is wonderful. Couple of clarification on this. Uh, starting with curd, right? I remember uh, when I was I'm a '90s kid, right? We used to go to the neighborhood dairy shop, uh -huh. and he used to have the curd that he has started to prepare one night before. Uh -huh. And he used to take out from. it and today we go and buy it from the shop on a plastic container does this all is there a difference uh, or the uh, probiotics is same even in the packed so as a matter of fact it differs based on the milk oh so the source of milk ha, the manufacturer is it's a whole milk 2% 1% so okay. it differs and also the other thing to consider is that you know it has lactobacillus right mm -hmm. but the key thing is we don't know whether kp needs lactobacillus Okay. So that's what the key thing is. Uh, so it is always about trial and error method. Trial and error. Ah, um, so you try yogurt. Sometimes, if you're lactose intolerant, you might not be able to handle it. Right. Ah, uh, but if you eat yogurt, so that's why I tell my patients is that every meal is the most important thing that you can do to yourself. Correct. You need. People talk about me time. Yeah. I talked about meal time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Meal meal time is your me time. Me time. Uh, yes. It's as long as not the TV or the scrolling. Ha. Uh, focus. See how you are feeling. Hmm. Those five ten minutes will go big right. time. Correct. Big time. Ha. Uh, Absolutely. But great. if you walk in a restaurant any time, I guarantee you, KP, here in Delhi, show me a restaurant where there is no cell phones involved. <laughs> oh, it's hard to find. Hard to find. But I think that's a beautiful point. Uh, like you said, the me time, and uh, I follow Ayurveda a lot, and they uh -huh. say that Atma Gyan uh -huh. is the bigger uh, book than any book you will ever read. Uh -huh. So you observing yourself mm. for a certain period of time with certain activities uh -huh. will give you more knowledge than Correct. any amount of book you can Absolutely. read. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. But coming back to this, <laughs> so couple of more clarification. I asked about the curd market, and you mm. said it's a trial and error method. Uh, is does achar also come under fermented? Yes. Yes, but achar you cannot eat in copious amounts. Ah, so uh, but you don't need that much. Ah, ah, because it's rich in sodium. You know, hypertensive people should be very careful. But again, the concept is fermented as well. Oh, so it. the other thing is you have to include different kinds of fermented products Variety. as well. So for example, you are born and raised in Delhi. Uh -huh. I was born and raised in Madurai. Right. Correct. So idli is not your uh, staple natural diet. Food, natural yeah. food. Idli is my natural diet. Again, roti and paranta yes. must be your staple. Yes, absolutely. If you check your gut bacteria, we could see all parotas over there. <laughs> Maybe it is gross, but not that much. <laughs> all the bacteria requiring parotas will be in your body. Huh. All bacteria requiring idli will be in your really body. Nice. So when you come to Madurai and you have an idli, you might not like it right away. Uh, oh, so likingness of the food is also related again going back to entric and central. Correct, correct. Oh wow! So you have to develop that gut bacteria in your body to digest that much amount of food. So I think the biggest concept I'm getting out of this is all these uh, terms like. My habit is eating paratha. Ha. Right. मेरे मन को वही अच्छा लगता है. All of this was more science rather Correct. than thinking that कि ये मेरा मन कह रहा है. It's not मन. It's the relationship between how you have been grown up and what your system already knows 
right and how it is communicating with your brain good bad whatever it is correct correct it's a marriage it's a marriage you want to make sure that it's not divorced <laughs> <laughs> you be careful when you do it <laughs> lovely lovely so uh, okay so you talked about the probiotic foods uh, coming to prebiotic so prebiotic is the supplements that we are giving to the bacteria we are basically feeding you remember i told you you need to feed two people correct so we talked about fiber 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 so let me talk a little bit more about the fiber yes fiber is nothing but sugar correct mm -hmm. so carbohydrates is the bigger uh, yeah. umbrella, term. umbrella term people are saying carbohydrate is bad you know you shouldn't eat carbs mm. that is not true mm. carbohydrates was termed bad because of the monosaccharides and disaccharides mm, right. what i mean by that is carbohydrates is umbrella term and if you have one sugar molecule it's monosaccharide that's where your fructose, glucose, galactose comes in. Chini. Chini. Right. <laughs> Correct? Sugar. Right. Then the second one would be disaccharide. Right. Where you have sucrose, maltose and lactose, your milk. Milk. Okay. Comes on the second one. Okay. Right. Sugar is also sucrose, right? glucose and uh, fructose together. Correct. And the third one is your oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. Yes. Oligosaccharides is where 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. three. So you combine sucrose, maltose, uh -huh. lactose together, then is oligosaccharides. And polysaccharides is where all these oligosaccharides combine together and form like 9 or 20 or 30 combinations. Mm -hmm. So people say that uh, fruit uh, fructose is bad, right? So then they say well, fructose is bad because fruits contain fructose. So then That's fruits are right. also bad. Right. That is the absolute myth out there. Uh -huh. Because fructose is bad if it is available in the single, single form. Uh, monosaccharide, monosaccharide form. Right. Because when you eat fructose, let's say you eat an Oreo biscuit. Mm -hmm. It has high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. It goes there mm -hmm. and then your small intestine loves it. Right. Because it is easy to absorb. absorb. Very easy. Provides instant energy. Very easy. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's like me when my wife goes to India. <laughs> very happy. <laughs> Hopefully my wife doesn't see the podcast. <laughs> Very happy. Okay, then there is nothing that goes into the colon right. because all this is being absorbed right there. Absorbed. Huh. Right. But the same fructose when you give through apple, correct? Mm -hmm. And that is or banana, whatever it is. It's a complex fructose, like sixty uh, molecules. It has to pass because we cannot digest it. We don't mm -hmm. have the enzyme to digest it. Mm -hmm. Example is onion. Mm -hmm. Onion bulb has something called inulin. Yes. I-N-U-L-I-N. Mm -hmm. Inulin is a complex fructose uh, cage. Oh. It's beautifully connected. It goes through our intestine. We don't have the enzymes to digest at all. So when the onion comes into the large intestine, this mm -hmm. whole inulin complex of the 60 polysaccharides, we don't have the enzyme to digest, but the gut bacteria yeah. in the large intestine has a key to open the cage. Okay. So it opens the cage and they just have a party over there. <laughs> right. When they have a party over there, the good thing about them is they create more bacteria to have more party. More party. So oh. then you crave for more onions. It's a chain reaction. It's a chain reaction. Got it. So nowadays what's happening is I'm seeing onions only in that uh, fried chicken when they give like two lemons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, but, but how bad is a party happening in small intestine versus large intestine, right? Because small intestine is also having a party when it's having simple carbs. Correct, right? correct. So, how bad it is, right? So, it's you know, small intestine is gaining more power over large intestine in this modern era, modern era, correct. Because all the food that we are eating is just completely taken up by small intestine per se, right. So we need to change that routine so that we can give more power to the large intestine. Large intestine. Mm. Got it. Got it. So I think we have addressed uh, most of the gut related outputs as well. Right. Uh, there's one question. Uh, so we ran some surveys with our audience that what they need to ask. And there are some interesting people. And they ask, what is the link or association or does is there a link or association between gut microbiome and your sex life? Does that exist? Uh, it does. It does. Seriously? Ah, it, it really does. I'm not talking about my personal life. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, you remember we talked about this, how, uh, uh, you know, this signals goes to the brain and everything. Mm -hmm. The other most important thing is it controls your metabolism. 
the rate at which your calories are burned and the rate happen? it's based on the same kind of neurochemicals and transmitters and hormones as well okay so that's why we are saying that you know obesity is being linked to the gut bacteria and that is directly linked to diabetes as well mm-hmm. which is bottom line denominator is that if you have good gut bacteria all your hormones will work effectively well regulated very well regulated right. this is absolutely critical in women because we only have testosterone correct we are very simple yeah. women are very complex because they have estrogen, estrogen. they have progesterone right. it has to be secreted in the first 14 days of the ovulation right. cycle it has to stop 5 days before the second right. i feel really really very impressed and then inspired by this life cycle what they are going through absolutely uh, so they start their innings with one wicket down right to be technically right. because uh, both those hormones too with, much coordination too much coordination is needed right but look at their lifestyle after the baby is born activity gets ah uh, i don't know their sleep cycle gets messed up in our really messed up. in our culture women are the one to take care of the kids mostly mostly, mostly. even though it's yes. changing mostly yes. and then they compromise their life they will do anything for their baby but they don't take care of themselves correct but they are the ones to be taken care okay, taken for care. the hormones to be recycled right. so this gut bacteria is very critical for women yeah. i have a strong feeling that if we make sure that the gut bacteria is good in every 15 year old or 10 to 15 year old girls there will be no pcos at all so pcos also comes down there i have a strong feeling i cannot prove it in right. clinical research studies right. but in basic science we can clearly see that this gut bacteria is controlling all the hormones, hormones including sex hormones right so that's why i'm thinking that i mean there are multiple research also showing that if you implant a, a testosterone free mice and if you uh, implant the gut bacteria with a normal testosterone this testosterone level goes up oh i was my second question was that only because uh, especially relevant to our audience would be can gut microbiome lead to testosterone increase right first of all is there a term like testosterone increase or we are bringing back the suppressed testosterone number one and number two what is the method to do that right because half of the concern uh, there are two main concerns for any gym goer uh, one is how to increase protein synthesis mm-hmm. and how to increase testosterone mm-hmm. so first first let's concentrate to how to increase testosterone i am a Uh, 19 year old entering the gym i am a 28 year old entering the gym i am a 38 year old entering the gym the first thing that everybody is talking about is how to increase testosterone testosterone yeah so to start with okay. the reason i'm saying that is um you know so taking a supplement when your sleep is not good when your nutrition is not good is like you know drinking green tea after, after eating biryani <laughs> Right. so that doesn't work so basically you need to change the mindset mm. there is a role for supplements for sure but not in this group of population no, right? that's fine the same thing is for testosterone as well testosterone is where you are uh, i mean we talk, um, sleep obviously increases the testosterone levels because of you know uh, um, hormone regulation second in rhythm but with gut bacteria when your hormones are better controlled testosterone which is suppressed as you said that comes up gets triggered this trigger mm-hmm. let's say that let's not talk about the numbers let's not talk about high numbers and low numbers mm-hmm. even if you have low testosterone what is the quality of the testosterone mm-hmm. that is the key mm-hmm. so uh, if you have a good gut the quality of the testosterone level goes up so okay. let's say that you are 19 year old you are going to gym you want to increase your testosterone levels the first thing that you should do is to avoid all processed foods ah. anything comes under a package right. anything ultra processed is a big no no right. because that doesn't directly increase your testosterone that is good for your gut yeah. and your gut will love you back by increasing your testosterone increasing that are there any studies which have already proven uh, any quantification of this um in basic science in mice yes they have remember the clinical research i told you that it is very difficult to yes. do this correct uh because most of the healthy people are who are going to gym or having a healthy diet to start with right so it's very difficult it's to difficult. tease out yeah. but now there is a big study that is going on huge study which will take some time 3 4 years to come out um where all these questions will be answered 
Okay, mm. oh lovely. Coming back to the second concern of the gym goer is uh, how to increase protein synthesis and the science behind that is that you go to the gym, you break your muscles, you provide enough nitrogen uh, from protein in your blood, uh, more are the chances of muscle recovery happening and new muscles forming. Right, hence increasing protein synthesis, right, getting more protein out of each food. First of all, increasing the amount of protein and then digesting most of that protein which reaches your blood levels will feed your muscles better. Correct, correct. Right, uh, so does gut microbe and taking care of the gut health will lead to protein synthesis? Um, I'll answer that in two parts. Right. Uh, one is, uh, you remember I talked about that uh, lining of the intestine. Yes. Uh, where it yes. is like closely linked, it's yeah. like a firewall, a cracker. Right. The more closely it is linked, the better the absorption. Ah. The more distant it is, there is the seepage of this thing. Oh, got it. So, uh, it is basically like a, a sealed pipe. Ah, yes. Ah. You stretch it, the you gaps are there. Correct. Then the water starts leaking. Right. When the water starts leaking, the absorption is not there. Correct. So, to get that thing going, right. we need good, uh, good gut bacteria. So that's number one. Number two is the main reason that we, you know you must have seen. In, I've seen this when I was in my weight loss journey. Uh, I was lifting weights. My personal trainer said that you have to take a whey protein mm -hmm. uh, because your protein content is very low. Right. So I said, okay, I took one scoop of thirty grams of protein. Okay, right, right away I started having bloating. Right. Significantly. Absolutely. Ah, uh, and then I started having constipation. Right. Um, I, I was like, okay, that's fine, you know, this is new thing, I'll get used to it. So then I realized that I don't have the gut bacteria to digest this. Right. Because my body is not exposed to this. Absolutely and right. 30 grams of protein per supplement Absolutely is too much for me. Right. It might be okay for KP. Right. So then I tried, oh, okay, so this product is not good, I'll go to this product. One good thing in US is that you can walk into any fitness product and get a sample for free. Yeah, yes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to all products and that guy said that in next time you come in, you need to pay. <laughs> 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 so the, then finally I realized that it's not the product, it is just me not getting exposed. Then that reminded me of this research that I was dealing with, where you have, have you eaten sushi? Yes. Sushi. Sushi yeah. uh, is a sea, sea. Sometimes they roast in seaweed. Salmon, yeah. Uh, salmon, seaweed, seaweed and everything. Yeah. You know, most of the uh, uh, people will not have seaweed digesting bacteria. Uh, of course, we have never been exposed we to it. We have been exposed to it. Right. Okay. Have you ever thought about a marine algae to have a bacteria in us mm. digesting a marine algae, right? Right. That is unheard of. Unheard what of. has happened is in Japanese community, they started eating seaweed oh, yes. and slowly that got evolved. Correct. And then we, we will not find seaweed producing bacteria in our body, but you will find it in Japan. Right. So same way, when you're having a protein powder, your body might not be able to digest right away. So you need to slowly introduce it. Absolutely. Correct. So one scoop bloating, don't think that protein powder is bad. Right. Half the amount and right. then see how you do. Or change the product and see yes. what happens. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, uh, you won't believe it, but that's the cut, copy, paste history of our product Biozyme. Oh, is it right? <laughs> yeah, it's cut, copy, paste. So, as I told you, right, we started Muscle Vision in 2012 uh -huh. and we got the experts, we got the formulations done and uh, we kind of replicated what was going in the market, uh -huh. right? And constantly we are hearing the feedback that when I take your protein, I go through IBS, I go through uh, diarrhea, uh, right? Diarrhea is more common in uh, the herd uh, in, uh, investigation that we heard I versus see. bloating. I see. Right, but it goes either of the two. Uh, uh -huh. And we are doing all kind of micro, uh, you know, testing on the product where there is bad bacteria and uh, uh, it is toxic, what is happening, there is nothing coming out. Uh, and then we said, ki, okay, age old marketing rule, go to the customer, uh, go to the customer. Uh, you won't believe it, we went to homes uh. of some 100 plus customers from wow. North India, uh, West, uh, North and West is major markets, uh. right? And what we realized is, there was a clear demarcation. Uh. So clear demarcation that somebody who has tried protein product for the first time is facing this. Uh. Right? And somebody who has, let's say, been historically been taking whey protein powders, mm. etc., coming from, let's say, Punjabi families, mm. has a lot of protein in the diet otherwise, mm. was not having this problem. 
and wow. it was just became so crystal clear after those interviews because we we went we, we go to their homes we understand ki pehle kya khate the what did you used to eat uh, is there a first supplement he saying yes i trusted your ad i bought it but then my stomach got bad and how much did you take my my trainer said to go take two scoops you're working so hard he started taking two scoops suddenly he is in deep shit right so that is where we came back uh, our r&d worked on it and uh, we made enzymes uh, for the protein digestion to happen mm. right and as we speak now we are also working on the microbiome uh, what kind of microbiome would be needed if indians need to digest protein but i was so surprised and happy that you have a completely same journey <laughs> which happened and it was actually part of my question also that uh, <laughs> beginners go to the gym mm-hmm. the first thing they are recommend is a high protein diet mm-hmm. uh, good trainers i'm talking about good trainers do not immediately recommend supplementation mm-hmm. they say you increase your protein mm-hmm. and uh, then in the second step they think you can t- start taking protein correct. powder and the first thing that most of these consumer face is their stomach going back correct correct right mm-hmm. and and as you shed light on it there is largely related to you not having those microbiome in correct those. So your recommendation is to start with let's say half a scoop and then gradually Correct. increase. Correct, half a scoop, gradual increase. Mm. Um and maybe, you know, your body is not ready for high protein diet as of now. Okay. So slowly increase. So, you know, I remember that, you know, when I was doing this they said um pound, they go by pound in US. They say said you have to have 150 grams of protein Correct. per day. Yeah. Uh 1 gram per pound. Per pound. So yes. I was 150, 150 yes. grams of protein yes. per day. I was calculating my protein intake was 72. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually. So how do I increase 150? So I started taking all the scoops. Then I realized that the best way to do this is you can increase it naturally you can take 50 50 yes so 100 grams of protein 75 through natural 25 through base supplements um, absolutely correct that worked for me yeah. then i slowly increased to 100 natural and 35 with the protein, protein something like that um, our own recommendation to customers is try to keep it just 20% Ah. right if possible of course you will have busy days you can increase mm. two two scoops that day but try to keep it between 20 25% and just mm. go through mm. food mm. right uh, sticking to the topics which are uh, around the gym consumers yes, yes. right uh, there is also one more thing what happens uh, for a person who is going through the gym is and now we are happy very happy to hear you are also embarking on a muscle gain journey soon i'll yes. talk about it yeah. right uh, is the concept of uh, bulking and cutting mm-hmm. right so basically the concept is uh, muscle building is a difficult mm-hmm. thing to do mm-hmm. and to create the right environment for muscle building you go in a calorie surplus mm-hmm. right because in calorie deficit you are in a catabolic stage it is very difficult for body to build muscle so you go through calorie up right you increase the calories for a certain period of time and then you decrease the calories for a certain period of time hoping that the muscle that you have made in calorie surplus sticks Correct. in calorie deficit Correct. Uh, but these changes uh, uh, what happens is that you go through that whole period when you are changing whether increasing too much or decreasing too much you go through a phase where mm. your stomach is all over the place mm. so what according to you as a gastro doctor could be the reason for that um, so uh, every individual is unique right. because of the fingerprints bacteria that correct. they have correct, correct. so <laughs> I can talk about this personally as well you know they told me to bulk up mm. and then cut a later uh, rather than cutting now or they said we couldn't blend both together and then do the hypo calorie a little bit yeah. increase the protein slide intake slight yeah. deficit and everything so I have a feeling that you know if I think especially for our uh, community for Indian uh, community um I don't think that there is a one size fits all kind of thing at all Mm-hmm. um so it has to be individualized it see how that works for you mm-hmm. so let's say you are a skinny fat person like me mm-hmm. uh bulking might be a problem yes ha uh, that's what ha uh, it's a bulking yeah. the reason is there is always this hormonal regulation that will bring you back to the normal set mm-hmm. mechanism that you're already in already in uh, optimized and optimized uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the research is showing that there is also this hormone regulation tied down to this drug f- ma- mafia in your uh, gut gut yes uh, so one way to look at this is mm-hmm. so you choose something okay bulking or cutting whatever your personal trainer says uh, but at the same time start working on improving your uh, gut bacteria right uh, then consciously supported consciously supported um 
So I think this is the right time to talk about how to improve the good gut bacteria. Yes, yes. Um, so as we talked about, fiber is one of the main thing. So let's say a person wants to bulk. What I would do is that I would make sure they have at least 40 grams of fiber per day. Hmm. Which is very difficult to achieve That's initially right. because fiber can make you bloated as well. Bloated as well. Uh, and also you're taking protein. Right. And also, also, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, sometimes it could it's be a, a disaster. cocktail of <laughs> <laughs> disaster recipe. Uh, but that might not be true for everybody. Some you, you may be able to handle it. So you have to go slowly. Step by step. Step by step. Minimum 25 grams, I think any, any can handle. Right. Then you slowly up to 30, 35, 40. Uh, sometimes you can even go up to 50 grams of fiber. So I always say that 25 grams of fiber per to start with, you reach to maximum of 40 to 50 as much as possible. Then second thing is complex carbs, mm. which is your fruits, right. your vegetables, vegetables, your whole grain, right. your legumes. Right. All this has this cage that we talked about right. where you are feeding your second baby. Yes. Mm. Got it. If you do this on a daily basis for three months, uh -huh. your gut bacteria will repopulate. Right. And if your balance is like this, right. we'll be able to balance it up. Got it. Mm. Uh, this brings me uh, to two interesting questions, uh, if I may ask you. According to you, which Indian diet, right? So there's a South Indian diet, Correct. there's a Western diet, North Indian diet, Punjabi diet, Punjabi. diet <laughs> uh, Northeastern food, uh, coastal food. Correct. Uh, what according to you or best of your knowledge is which diet is most suited to support the gut? Um, so you'll be surprised that India is the only country where there is fermented foods available locally in every state. Oh, how's that? So, Idli, I understand. Idli in Tamil Nadu, uh, Dokla in Gujarat, right. Enduri Pita in Odisha, right. Kurisa in Assam, right. there's a fermented bamboo shoots. Oh, yes, yes, I've seen in some documentaries. Ah, yeah. Exactly, fermented yeah. bamboo shoots. And Manipur has their own dish, uh, Kanji in uh, Punjab. Right. And if you take any uh, particular area, if you go deep into it, there is always our Indian traditional fermented dish. Yes. That they uh, have overnight evolved over a period of time. Over a period of time. That right. is, this I have not seen that much in other culture. Right. Kimchi is there in Korean uh, yes, culture. Sauerkraut is there, yeah. and uh, kombucha is there, kombucha and everything. Is there. Uh, but not to this extent. To be honest, if we can create a store mm -hmm. where we can have all the states right. of India and then produce a fermented foods. foods. That will be the super power, super food area. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me an idea to open up a store like that. <laughs> nice, nice. Huh. Uh, second part of this question is, uh, if you have to zoom out and take a point of view on the world, mm. right? Uh, so same opinion on the world, which, which cuisine or which country has the most optimized diet, according to you? Um, I would say that not optimized diet is a Western diet. Ah, yes, that's that's the easy. That's answer. an easy answer. <laughs> uh, but the optimized diet is in. I'm I'm just starting from a pure gastroenterology standpoint. I'm going to get some beef for this. Mm. The technique is beef. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm talking from a pure gastroenterological standpoint, where multiple research have shown that our gut bacteria loves plants. Yes. Loves plants. Correct. Because the cell wall of plant is a polysaccharide. Okay. Remember we talked about the mono, yes, di, right. oligo, poly. poly correct. Right. Poly is where you need to feed your gut bacteria. Right. And plant cell wall is lined with right. all these polysaccharides like right. pectins and everything, right. which your gut bacteria loves. Right. So multiple studies have shown that if you're a vegetarian diet, gut bacteria just proliferates like crazy. Mm -hmm. If you're a non-vegetarian diet, it doesn't mean that your gut bacteria is not proliferating, but it proliferates less yes. because there is no fiber associated with it. Mm -hmm. So from a gastroenterology standpoint, any culture which has a vegetarian predominant diet right. is good for your gut bacteria, which from a gastroenterological yes. biased aspect would be the best diet. Best diet. So I, I, there's always a controversy surrounding this where you know right. you should be a vegetarian or you should be a non-vegetarian. Non so I always tell my patients is that you go Dr. Palitarian. <laughs> nice one. 
बट बट देखिए ना आउटसाइडर पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू है राइट सो सी द ओवरऑल डाइट इज ऑल्सो मिक्सचर ऑफ हैविंग द राइट बैलेंस ऑफ प्रोटीन ऑफकोर्स द प्लांट्स द फाइबर एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट विच आई पर्सनली एज अ स्टूडेंट ऑफ डाइट बिलीव दैट प्योर वेजिटेरियन डाइट इन इंडिया काइंड ऑफ लैक्स सीवियरली ऑन द पार्ट ऑफ द प्रोटीन करेक्ट right that what happen what happens is probably the gut part is taken care of but you will have typical protein deficiency diseases Correct. later on absolutely right so i was coming from that point of view the balance of protein being there plants being there fiber being there so that that's that's more complex thing to right so that's why i say that you know in the dr palitarian diet what i say is three meals a day yeah seven days a week yeah. 21 meals a week Correct. in the 21 meals you go 80% vegetarian Yes, okay. which is like fifteen, sixteen meals vegetarian. Okay. The remaining four meals you can have non-vegetarian, non-vegetarian. so that you can supplement the protein. Got so, it. in my opinion, extremes don't work. Right, mm-hmm. got it. Mm-hmm. That's that's how the balance right works. <laughs> got it. Let's go to the gut and athlete. Right, huh. so there are a lot of high performers huh. uh, mm-hmm. who are who are working towards, you know, India is kind of evolving. going into a very beautiful zone where our sports is diversifying. Although there are very early signs. Uh, We are getting medals in javelin. Our Asian Great. teams have been supremely good. There are a lot of youngsters uh, who are preparing for this, right? So, uh, is there any case study or any examples where an elite level athlete has improved his performance uh, by by working on the gut? See, uh, there is a documentary called "What the Health." Have you seen in uh, in Netflix? Oh yes, 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 uh, yes, yes. So, they talked about uh, you know vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. Game changers. Game right? changer as well, yeah. and also there's a new recent thing about what the health as well. Right. Game changer was like three four years ago, mm. and there's a follow up on that. There was a recent thing. Mm-hmm. In game changer, if you look at that, so the point that they were trying to make was, look at this big um, uh, bodybuilder, yeah. weightlifter, sumo wrestlers. They are vegetarians. Right. And uh, uh, you know you don't necessarily have to have this high. protein non vegetarian just to become a big bodybuilder yeah. so in that documentary if you see all these elite athletes mm. were doing much better mm. or equally better equally better on vegetarian diet vegetarian diet so i have a strong feeling that if you look at their gut bacteria mm-hmm. they will definitely be proliferating so much where the species will be a lot more than a oh. other uh, low fiber diet okay Got it. Um, so the other angle to this is, you know, millets, right? Yes. Millets or complex carbs. Correct. Millets is one of the polysaccharides that we talked about. Right. Um, millets were initially in India until 1964, uh-huh. until the rise in wheat thing took over because yes. we wanted to have big uh, mass production. Correct. Millets are still the staple diet in Africa. Yes. So yeah. if you, when people have done research on gut bacteria in African athletes as uh-huh. well. where there is a significant difference in terms of the number of uh, variety of variety gut of. bacteria oh there has to be some kind of relationship or relationship yes cool yes. relationship which of course you are saying the next it's very early days of uh, research and microbiome and huh. still next 10 15 years will unfold many new secrets correct correct right. so my point is that yes you know do you have a research study showing this probably not at this time but we are seeing so many signs pointing towards that Why don't we adopt this and at least be aware of it aware of and try this. to include it as much as possible? Yeah. So when it becomes mainstream, we can hit the ground running. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. We had such lovely time talking about gut health, and uh, you know some of the revelations were you know the connection between enteric nervous system and central nervous system and how it is controlling habits, and uh, I think that whole loop uh, of good habits. making you choose good things without getting tempted about other things uh, after learning all of this i am fine now i realize the importance but how do i measure where do i stand today ha huh, huh. how to do that so um, there was there there are like privately available stool kits correct right you know okay. they will say advertise that hey you know get this and then we will measure the good gut bacteria bad gut bacteria so there is a role for that as well uh where what they can do is they can give you this category about okay so you know in this proportion so you have like so it's a, a stool test that you it's a stool test okay there is no blood test as of now okay it's only a stool test right ha huh. so and is the does this work 
Huh. So, what the reinterpretation would be that, hey, you know, these are all the bacteria that is depleted. These are all the bacteria is good for you. Yeah. And you figure it out. Okay. So, what they would say is based on the research, lactobacillus is good. So, you have lactobacillus, which means that you have good bacteria. Mm. But the point that people are missing is whether KP needs that lactobacillus or not. Right. We talked about it before. Right. So, whether this test results will apply to you, nobody can say no, no, at no, this no. time. But these test results can give you an overview of, oh, okay, good, maybe we have so much bad bacteria, so we need to change things. Right. See, the other way to look at this is, I always do the simple test where, you know, you just measure your waist circumference. Uh, you take an inch tape, measure on your belly button, if it is more than 90 centimeters in men, which means that there is some kind of visceral fat inside your body. Right. Uh, which means that your hormones are not regulated. not regulated. Which your hormones are not regulated, which means you get bacteria is not good. So uh, you don't have to spend like three hundred, four hundred dollars for this gut bacteria. You can donate to my charity. <laughs> <laughs> which will go in the research. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were researching on this interesting topic, how to measure gut health. Uh, there was a lot of uh, material available. Check your poop for this. Uh, Does that work? Yeah, yes, it does work. Okay, but not in the way that they are promoting. Uh, in a way that there is this uh, Bristol stool chart. Okay. okay. It's a formal. It's a formal well structured chart. Uh, structured chart where a gastroenterologist we use it to see whether the patient is constipated oh. or the patient is diarrhea. Okay. So it goes from one to seven. Got it. So normal is between three and four, where you have normal, smooth, soft. We say silky. Right. Okay. <laughs> We are not talking about eating it. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be three S. Smooth, soft okay. and silky. Okay. Okay. And uh, does it also relate to how many times in a day? Or uh, not, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. It's, oh, about the, uh, it's about the morphological appearance of the stool. Okay. So let's say it is very hard. It comes in pebbles. Then mm -hmm. it is stool one, stool uh, bristol type one, type two. Mm -hmm. And let's say it is like runny, watery. Then it is mm -hmm. like six and seven. Okay. So, somewhere between 3 and 4 will be normal. So, that's your take-home kind ah. of test. Ki you can you can look for this Bristol stool form. Stool chart. chart. You can just Google it. Right. We can also provide some link in the description. Right. Bristol stool chart will give you the pictures. Pictures of... Ah. And this. you can assess, okay, where I stand. If you're around like 3 or 4, it's you can it's a good extrapolation that your gut health may be good. You are all doing good. Ha, ah, you're doing good. And does that timing of uh, the stool also uh, does that that morning huh. you get up, you go to the washroom, you clean yourself up, uh, and for somebody who is not feeling that for let's say first five hours of the morning, does that mean that he's going through a bad gut health? Ha, huh. so that is something that uh, we have created that it has to be daily right. and it has to be in the morning. Okay. And the third, I mean, we have created that myth. And the third... It's a myth. It's a myth. Uh, it's a myth that we have created that it has to be daily uh -huh. and it has to be in the morning. And the third thing, it has to be after a sutta. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the area we can't do. <laughs> yes. Sutta chai. Sutta chai. <laughs> right. right. My roommate, you know, you know, I still believe, I still remember that. That in the morning, 5 a.m., he mm -hmm. wakes up, he runs to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> to get the soda. <laughs> the soda and comes back comes again. Back. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, I think it's just a uh, brain mechanism repetition. Uh, but the key thing is that, you remember I talked to you about it takes 50 hours to yes. travel from oral cavity to the yes. anal orifice. So, everybody is different. Correct. Okay. Uh, you could even have once in two days. That could be your normal bowel movement for KP. Okay. And every day for me, normal bowel movement for PAL. But when KP, who was having a normal ball movement once every two days, right. now having once every three days, a problem. that's the problem. Got it. Huh. So right. the change in the frequency and change in the consistency of the stool is the problem. Which I have observed. So for example, if I go to US, right? So that's an entirely new huh. eating habits mm. for me. I'm not getting my kind of food. The, the, the whole system goes for a toss. Mm. Uh, now moving to the next part, uh, we, we spoke about how to measure gut health. Uh, if I have to ask you, what are the major red flags which destroy your gut health? Like, which mm. are an absolute no-no, mm. right? So, which things would those be? Which activities would those be? Um, there are two 
activities one is the patient maid uh, the second one is doctor maid doctor maid okay <laughs> <laughs> patient maid is mainly about ultra processed foods hmm. ultra processed what foods. are these ultra processed foods so mm. many people don't even realize they are having an ultra processed correct food. that's correct. my guess so as a gastroenterologist we always recommend patients that you should eat food in the natural form okay okay so natural form is fruits fruits okay. or natural forms so that is easy right but you we cannot follow ancestral life anymore in a very modern era Correct. so a little bit of processed is okay which means you know like the rice the wheat if you're a little bit processed from the natural uh -huh. um and then uh, uh, that's also okay uh, the ultra process is where for example uh you add sugar to it artificially you add natural flavors to extend the shelf life of oh, the product yes. yeah. and uh, to improve the taste of it you create an artificial environment that is where ultra processed food is where that's where your cookie pizza biscuit uh all these uh, sports drinks mixed with uh, sugar uh, diet co i mean coke pepsi everything comes along in that thing got it um so you don't have to really think about oh pro all processing is bad that's not uh -huh. true But some highly ha huh, um, highly ultra the moment it transfers into a mono saturated kind of an environment is what you are saying ha huh, or okay. anything in general we could say in a packet ha uh, huh, in, in, in general in general yeah Uh, and if it ready is ready to eat in a packet ha uh, art also comes in a packet but you have to cook it correct exactly ha yeah. uh, ready to eat ready to eat in a packet uh, yeah in a packet is. or you know if you tear it and then if it is in sugar ultra processed food then it's a problem got it ha uh, so i always say this is my favorite thing is when you're tearing a package you're tearing a piece of your gut oh <laughs> right right and the other one you said is doctor made ha uh, doctor made is where we give antibiotics to the patient Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh in US that's the case. In India that is also man made. Yes. <laughs> Because nobody goes to doctor to get uh, an antibiotic. Can, chemist will tell me how chemist. to cure the fever. <laughs> right? Correct. Right. Friendly neighborhood chemist. Friendly. <laughs> <laughs> because who's going to give 500 rupees to the exactly. doctor he's going to prescribe the same and eventually he's giving me same medicine for last 3 years can we take it from the chemist only <laughs> so uh, the antibiotics what happens is you remember we talked about that 100 trillion firewall a cracker yeah. one course of antibiotics blast that 50% off oh my god blast that 50% off so it mm -hmm. is very difficult to repopulate that's number one number two the phase after the antibiotic is extremely critical so people who are watching this antibiotics are good if it is absolutely indicated for some reasons mm -hmm. so let's say you have a big tonsillitis that is not going away you need antibiotic yes please go and take it but after the antibiotic course it is absolutely critical what is what you are putting in your mouth because remember the real estate that we talked about 50% yeah, is gone gone you have to repopulate it. repopulate the remaining 50% is the it's a lottery ticket for whoever gets in first uh, right so, so but what is happening right now is after antibiotic people are thinking that oh you know my body is stressed out i need something to rejuvenate right. uh, i have gone through all this right. let me eat this bad food god i deserve this because i was sick So we need to train the mindset. We you need to have all your good foods right after that episode of antibiotic. But that brings me to a logical uh, question: that why isn't a diet plan a standard part of practice for the doctor to give you post the antibiotic course? Absolutely. Why is that not happening then? You know, you should look from us as well, our standpoint as well. You know, we see like hundred patients in a given day. <laughs> Right. If we keep giving diet plans, I mean, it is not practically possible this time. But you have a point. So ideally, what should happen is that um, a patient coming in with anti uh, coming in with uh, infection, we give antibiotics. Right. All we need to say is that eat fiber-rich food. Right. You don't need like a very specified diet plan. Correct. No, that's fine. Mm. But it can always be a to-do list. Ha. Huh. right of course correct. it will get customized according to correct. the, the patient city yeah, what yeah. the person is mm. taking what all right etc etc but there should be a to do where it is saying that 
do you need to understand that there's a space which has been created of course we cannot go in that much detail for patient <laughs> but a to do list will help correct right so you know you could say that in my practice i also give antibiotics mm -hmm. because you know people get with gut infections so i do three things i say i give an antibiotic and i say that make sure you complete it number 1 number 1 you know people think that you know two days three days theek ho gaya man theek ho gaya because next time when you use the antibiotic it might not work Yes. Okay, so you need to complete the course. That's that's one thing, and the second thing is, uh, after you are doing or even during the course, I always say eat one fruit every meal. Mm. I always say every that meal. every meal. Oh, and once add, a day. Uh, yeah, because we believe one apple a day and we are done. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one apple a day maybe keep Dr. Pal away. Mm. I'm sorry. One apple a day will keep the doctor away, but you need to have three fruits to keep three Dr. Pal away. <laughs> <laughs> and then try to include one fermented food each meal as well. Okay. Okay. The third thing I always say is, people, if you think about it, they might be having difficulty in digesting milk products right after this antibiotic course. Correct. Sometimes. Uh, I've observed that. Huh. Yeah. They have bloating. They have yes. diarrhea and everything yes. because all this lactase thing is also so gone. gone. Huh. Right. So I always say that you know stay away from dairy products for like one or two weeks, right. and then once you slowly repopulate, then you go. Got it. Mm. Lovely. Oh, and the biggest thing is I don't want any person to go to the chemist and get the antibiotics yes. by themselves. Yes. Please make a rule that no chemist can prescribe antibiotics; only doctors should. And we have to strictly follow it. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, we got this. So now uh, we are entering uh, our special, most special segment, which is called the Zin moments, ah. right? And I am specifically impressed by, uh, you know, where you have come from and what you have become, because doctor for us has always been this very serious character, <laughs> right? Uh, so I have my relatives uh, who are doctors. Right, their whole personality is so strict that even if they're half a kilometer away, I will just stand up like straight, right? No, no nonsense, right? And here you come like a fresh breath of air, giving very, very right information in your own way, uh -huh. right? So first of all, what was uh, uh, what was the reason of motivation for this, right? And uh, what did you overcome, right? What what was perseverance behind this? Huh. So um, I was. I always say that doctors are the worst patients. No, they are. They're the worst patients. <laughs> I've seen Doctor House. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we are the worst, the worst patients. Thing. We don't follow what we preach. That was for me as well. My wake up call was. You remember I told you about that 15 years of uh, 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 training. Training uh, was brutal. Correct. I go at 7 a.m. I come at 1 p.m. the next day. Right. So I used to eat. My staple diet was you know curd rice. And fresh uh, fried chicken tenders, right? <laughs> and ready to eat Maggi noodles, correct? And this is what I ate every day because you know right. it was very busy. Uh -huh. And uh, during my studying phase, I have to work harder to second everything. So as you know, all this kind of like uh, populated bad gut bacteria in me. So I craved for this all the time. So I was pretty big. I was like hundred kilos. Oh seriously? And where you are? I am uh, sixty-five. My God, uh -huh. that's a lot. Not the other 35 kilos was lost over a span of like three to four years. Not bad. Or three to four years. Very controlled. Very controlled. Very slow. Mm -hmm. The change in mindset. Mm -hmm. It's not like a crash course yeah. diet yeah. and everything. So it was a very controlled environment. And the wake up call was because you know I had a small uh, uh, heart attack. Oh. Uh, at the age of like 34, 35. Oh, that's scary. Uh, it happened in US. In US. Okay. In US. You were in the middle of an activity. You were I was. I was seeing a patient. Oh God. Ironical. Ironical, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was seeing a patient. Then okay. they wheeled me into the emergency room. Uh -huh. uh, and then I chose, okay, can you get that doctor? I don't want this one. <laughs> because I know the insights. Right, right. So then uh, the Eureka moment was being a doctor myself, I know that every condition in my book, the treatment is weight loss. Every condition, fatty right. liver, weight loss. weight loss, stroke, weight loss, hypertension, weight loss, diabetes, weight loss, correct? You read about diabetes, weight loss, you turn the next page, they go to the next condition, and they don't talk about weight loss. weight loss. Correct. Then I said that the medical system is rigged. Correct. Ah, we talk about prevent, uh, we don't talk about treatment. Treatment, but nobody not talking about prevention. Nobody, yes. talking about nobody gets paid to give the prevention. <laughs> right? In US, 
all these cardiologists uh, who are preventing treating heart attack they're paid the highest absolutely correct primary care physicians were talking about oh sleep well yeah, drink water or the pay the lowest pay the lowest right so oh, pay the lowest that's where the whole system has i will not in, blame any individual but the whole system, system has, yeah. has rigged yeah, right system. over a period of time uh, but thankfully now thanks to people like you and i'm uh, so much thankful that people like you who are doctors who are well qualified mm. are coming on the platform and giving advices uh, because i can tell you some years ago it again it was a party of bad bacteria happening on youtube <laughs> yeah right anybody and anyone was giving advices uh. making some crazy edits and telling you what should be taken what should not be taken uh, till entertainment it is fine but it may not go in the right direction and ultimately even the youtube knowledge giving might become rigged correct right correct. because you don't know what the source is where is it coming from is it motivated not motivated and hence uh, we are very glad that qualified people like you are coming and talking about the topics they they specialize in yeah yeah thank right? you thank you yeah uh, so uh, you explained about how the weight loss uh, journey started for you because you went through a personal mm. heart attack mm. but how did content creation happen <laughs> it was an accident. Yeah, okay. It was an accident. So I created uh, during COVID time. I created an awareness video for a non-profit organization. Oh. So I was always in, was interested in stand-up comedy. I do. Oh, uh, that's even before content creation. Ah, even before content. <laughs> okay. So I uh, used to join a club, and then you know, I used to vent out my medical frustration. <laughs> which is there is a lot to share that's a lot to share <laughs> you know like patient writing google reviews about oh, god <laughs> so i i like it uh, yeah. the way that i deliver and if it reaches i be very happy um so i created a content for covid awareness acha uh, to a non profit organization so i sent it to them and they said you know this is not professional this looks like a stand up comedy <laughs> <laughs> they said what do i do uh, they said you know you put on youtube Uh, so I put in utilize YouTube, it. utilize <laughs> it exactly. So because of the timing, uh, COVID came two weeks before in US, okay. and COVID just hit India. Correct. And people were like very panicked about COVID. Yeah. So I, my video was slightly light-hearted. Yeah. Uh, so then people started sharing it, and that went viral more than the virus. <laughs> <laughs> Without hurting anybody. Without hurting anybody. <laughs> So then I realized that wow, this is a wonderful uh, medium right. where I can blend medical information with humor, uh, and I absolutely loved it. And the reason that I'm still doing it despite my full-time job is because the reach that I'm getting in terms of outcome, uh, I have seen so many before and after picture. Wow! Just with my YouTube videos alone. Wow. to people that i don't even know in all parts around the world i will never forget this email from sudan mm -hmm. an indian patient from an indian person who was settled in sudan mm -hmm. just followed my videos and he said no lost 25 kilos because of you in a span of one year oh that literally touched me and then you know her pc was got better she got ivf was successful and there was so many wow. successful stories yes. and i said that you know i am giving back something to the community yeah. and i want to do this and that's more fulfilling than any ha ha check that you can ever get correct and i can manage all the arguments with my wife later uh, <laughs> but what i observe this uh, do you want to share what are your future plans are you are you planning any new change in your content strategy ha ha so the my my goal is to get this to an in person setting Okay. So here right now I'm on a YouTube so you know one of my most of my videos reaches million views which means that million people have watched it but I'm not sure whether they are implementing it. Mm -hmm. So the next step is I go in person I talk about all this and I create a show. Okay. Uh, similar to uh, like a stand up comedian doing an one hour show. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a show called Medical Comedy. Oh. I create a new genre called Medcom. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> so my first netcom show was loss of weight loss. Ah, okay. Interesting. <laughs> loss of weight loss. So loss of weight loss. Ah, okay. The loss of oh, weight loss. loss. Oh, weight nice, loss. nice. <laughs> weight loss. So we have uh, we're doing a big fifteen uh, hundred seater right. in Coimbatore, which got sold out. Oh, lovely. Yeah, That's which means that the reach is there. Ah, hundred percent. Reach is there. <laughs> so in that. that show, I'm talking about my personal weight loss journey. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the tips and tricks that I uh, encounter? Difficulties yes. and a lot of crowd work in terms of you know what you encountered. Oh, 
and the moment that they walk out of the show mm-hmm. i'm pretty sure that they will implement at least one lifestyle habit right practically practically which will change that person life right the whole family will change right and the whole community will change right mm-hmm. and probably you leave some pointers where the child is being transferred good bacteria <laughs> that's a bad bacteria i think that's that's the most important correct uh, <laughs> part of or to close this puzzle as soon as possible right correct. close the loop as soon as possible correct correct right lovely and are you working on uh, any uh, uh, new series for youtube as well like a podcast yes yourself? yes i am uh, we are hosting a new podcast series oh nice the name is gut feeling with dr pal oh lovely <laughs> <laughs> lovely that's a what else could have been what else could have <laughs> <laughs> so and, and what's the central fulcrum or uh, fulcrum is about uh, gut bacteria okay uh, so i so the idea is we will invite all the experts uh-huh. and then we'll talk about everything mental health cardiac health and oh, nice. and i'm going to tell them how it is related to gut bacteria <laughs> <laughs> Idhar hi aao sab. Idhar hi aao sab. So lovely. And uh, coming to your aspect of uh, resistance training, so that's what I'm going to do next. Oh, so you're getting into? Ah, get, I I want muscle. Oh, lovely. Ah, uh, all my research is boiling down to the point that if I build muscle, I can eat my biryani more. <laughs> <laughs> Without paying any price. Without paying any price. <laughs> So I have learned that it requires a lot of discipline, Huge. lot of attention, and I really want to do that. I am skinny, but I'm not healthy. I belong to the category called skinny fat, as right. you know, because my body fat percentage is 25. Uh-huh. So I need to decrease that to 17, 18. Correct. So I'm going to do a, a fitness challenge, oh, nice. uh, and then show my audience. If this can also be done along with the weight loss after the weight loss. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and if this is not done, then I might not show the audience. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but this brings me back. Uh, okay, you just said that uh, you said two things. One, your research led you that everything is tied back to weight loss, mm. and now you are saying that your further research tells you that everything ties back to a certain muscle mass that one needs to carry, right? But why would you say the second statement? Oh, the second statement is you know. Um, so initially when i started i started the calorie game oh you know i need to do much this much amount of calories or biryani has this much amount of calories i can eat it so now as you know muscles are the best accompanied person that you could get mm-hmm. muscles are your f- best friend mm-hmm. maybe second best friend the first friend is gut bacteria right. <laughs> leading to leading to the muscle mass once you have good muscle they are so hungry Once you build that foundation, they will eat the excess carbs for you. For you. So it doesn't get converted into fat that much. But Dr. Bal, people are scared to become muscular. Can we can we simplify it for a daily person, right? So whenever they say uh, muscular, right? So to give some call, North Indian say that, yeah, I'm not going to become a bodybuilder. <laughs> right? I'm not going to become a bodybuilder. Somebody modern would say that I'm not going to become a Ronnie Coleman. Uh. So they have. they have just two images in their mind one is that skinny guy and then second is that mr olympia who is standing on a stage with 300 kg of or 300 pounds of muscle mass correct right how do you simplify it for a common person how much muscle mass should i have uh, i think that is uh, i think culturally it has been ingrained in us regarding the two differences hmm. culturally we have not been trained to think about normal normal correct so when i grew up when i go to gym my mom will be the first person to come to gym pull me out of right, it and then say oh you are wasting time yes uh, hmm. study which is good which that's why i became a doctor <laughs> <laughs> so but now if i would have do this all over again hmm. i would have hit the gym 30 minutes a day yes at least five times a week correct so that i wish somebody has told this to me at 20 years of age that muscle is the most important thing now i am 40 as you know it's difficult to build muscle as age advances not impossible uh-huh. it's definitely possible Difficult. but you need to do more, more effort of it. now more of good things ha huh. <laughs> more good things i keep it a very high frequency high frequency and you get more busier yes Kids, life is there family work profession correct so i wish somebody has told me that you know muscle is the way to go at age 20 right ha huh. so uh, and the second thing is people also think that women they think that if they lift weights they will become muscular like rithik roshan right 
ओवर नाइट नंबर वन बोथ यू एंड मी विल नॉट बिकम द ऋतिक रोशन second you are the one who actually need muscles because of the hormonal Hormones. dysregulation we talked about yes. when you hit the menopausal age osteoporosis yes, is waiting. peeping waiting yes. is waiting if you don't build your muscles around your knees around your hips correct the arthritis how many people that you know you are the the uh, you know your chachi uh, go for uh, knee replacement ha huh, how many people yes and it's all mostly women mostly women mostly women, mostly women. Right. i'm telling you in our country indian women are at such a disadvantage multiple, multiple levels that we need to change at grassroots level yes right. the vegetarianism uh, then uh, all the sacrifices by the lady mm. and uh, you know the sleep cycle getting disturbed the hormones going all over the place uh, even if the gym culture is coming is still not very normal for a woman to lift weights know, lift weights mm. right so then the whole uh, you know lifting weights leads to muscular muscular woman, uh, all of this just and even when modern women so no modern women is expected to do the job also correct and still take care of the family correct right so it's it's a double edged sword for them double edged sword for them uh, yeah but hopefully that changes yeah right? it is changing you know men are also equally uh, you know supporting participating everything yes. but as a family i think if a husband and wife is there with a little kid less than 10 years of age both of them should go to gym correct emphasizing the importance oh. of muscle building to that kid oh yes mm, that's the key Uh, you do teach it by actions and not by preaching correct correct <laughs> that's, the, that's the rule uh, but lovely to have you dr yeah, bhai sounds uh, cool hopefully we will have some follow up discussions also super uh, there are still many topics which are yet to be uncovered correct right uh, so see you in the future yes. all the best for all your endeavors thank you so much for having me thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot